Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective uh, for this Tuesday, December 8th. I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, we are glad to have you with us this, uh, this Tuesday morning. I want to first start by thanking all of our uh, community partners. Uh, we could not do these boot camp sessions without them. Uh, we've got this great list of uh, these partners that have helped us with boot camp sessions. Uh, they've shared their expertise, their time, their uh, and their tools and information. So they've been very, very helpful. Um, the Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective is designed to help small businesses work through this COVID crisis and return stronger than ever. It is a statewide initiative supported by all those community partners. And the boot camp, we're going to continue through December. We're going to take a couple weeks off and then start back up the first week of January. Uh, we're going to continue this on. They've been very successful and we want to continue providing these resources to the small businesses of Arizona. All the boot camp sessions can be found on our website, um, the same place where you registered. Um, for this session, you can go on and find the archive sessions. All of our previous sessions have been recorded and are listed by week. And uh, you can go back and watch those uh, videos of the webinars anytime you'd like and uh, review that material and download the slide decks. Um, that were used. Additionally, on our website, on um, the Small Business Bootcamp website, is our resource collective. And on the resource collective, we have the tools and resources that our community partners have provided uh, to help small businesses work through this time. Uh, lots of great tools on there. This is uh, an example of some of the resources you can find on the resource collective. You've got unemployment insurance, guidance for retail, safe retail. Um, professional beauty association back to work guidelines, national restaurant industry guide for restaurant uh, construction, manufacturing, uh, a lot of great resources to help all the different categories of small businesses. Uh, some quick updates um, for restaurants, the safest outside restaurant assistance program is now active and the application is available. We will post this link in the chat box. Um, this will take you to our website and then on our website, there will be a link to the state's application portal. Um, there's a lot more information on that portal uh, under the eligibility, but it's a great program to help restaurants that are looking to expand their premises uh, with some potential assistance. So please take a look at that. Uh, to help support that as well, tomorrow's boot camp session is a special session. Uh, normally they're Tuesdays and Thursdays, but we're doing a special Wednesday session uh, for restaurant relief webinars. Um, and it is gonna be focusing on premises extension. And we did a previous session on premises extension uh, in week 30. So if you wanna go back and watch that recorded session in week 30, there will be some updates tomorrow on the program along with uh, some information on the assistant program uh, as well. <clears throat> so it'll be a great session tomorrow for restaurants. <clears throat> Additionally, there's two programs going on this week and, and in particular today and tomorrow, the A.DBE and Small Business Conference started this morning. Um, it is a free conference for any, anybody that wants to attend. Um, so we've got the link. Again, we'll put that in the chat as well. But that, uh, that is today and tomorrow um, with a lot of great content. And then today at 10 o'clock, so right after the boot camp, the Arizona Small Business Association uh, has their Arizona Speaks. And it's the state of small business in Arizona today. Um, so that link for, to, to register for that, it is also free. Um, you can go to that link and uh, we'll post that in the chat so you can access it as well. Um, so some great uh, additional conferences to, to provide uh, support for small businesses. Additionally, you can utilize our website, uh, our COVID-19 Arizona Business Resources page for uh, all the updated information on, on the business resources, whether it's webinars, uh, financial workforce, um, et cetera, a lot of great content on there. We keep it updated as new information comes out. So many of you are aware of the, the programs that the ACA has to offer small businesses. We have our small business services uh, with a lot of great information and, and support there. 
our workforce division can help with the uh, hiring and training of employees and our Arizona MEP manufacturing extension partnership can help manufacturers small medium size uh, as they work to grow to be medium and large size so uh, they can help with the A to Z um, support uh, for all things manufacturing. We also have our small business checklist uh, during this time a lot of people are looking at how they can start their own side gig or their own business and a small business checklist is an online interactive resource to help individuals that are looking to start their business work through the uh, licensing or registration and compliance uh, requirements uh, for those small businesses. And you can find that at azcommerce.com forward slash small biz B-I-Z. And finally, we wanna just a quick note for the state's COVID-19 information and resource page, arizonatogether.org. So this week, uh, I like to call it the money week. We've got a lot of great sessions uh, to talk about money. We've got our update on paycheck protection program today our restaurant relief program tomorrow. And then our on Thursday will be small business funding opportunities. Um, and that's gonna be a great session as well. So uh, please uh, register and join us for those for these sessions this week. Uh, we're looking forward to them. So today we have Carrie Ann Todd. Uh, many of you have, have, that have been with us all year have heard her speak and, and share her expertise. Uh, she is a uh, senior manager of Beach Fleischman's accounting and insurance practice. Um, and she is an expert uh, on the PPP. And uh, we will go ahead and turn the time over to Carrie Ann, let her share her presentation. All right. Thank you, Robert. Um, and thank you to everyone at the Arizona Commerce Authority for having me back. Um, it's been a couple months. Uh, I believe the last time I was with you was in October. Um, I'd love to say we have a lot of great new information, but um, between then and now there was an election. And so I think everybody was a little distracted and there just wasn't a lot that come out, but um, there are a few things we're gonna go over today. And I have left plenty of time in the presentation for questions. Um, so if you wanna use the Q and A button and go ahead and post questions when you have them, um, then we can go ahead and um, see those. And I'm gonna make sure I have my meeting controls here so I can see the Q&A. And if I miss a Q uh, question, Lisa, if you'll just let me know um, and I'll pop to those. All right, just kind of a disclaimer, this presentation is everything as of yesterday that I'm aware of, um, you know, things keep changing, um, but unfortunately there hadn't been a lot lately, but this is, this is a dated presentation. So um, keep that in mind if you're coming back to read through or to see this presentation at a later date. Um, the information is as of today. All right, these are some things we're going to talk about. We'll talk through the application process, kind of where it stands right now. Uh, we'll talk about taxes, which is really the only new news and unfortunately not the best news. Um, I'm going to go high level a little bit on the third party payroll reports for those of you who might use an outside payroll service. Yeah, that provides um, PPP reports. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about the loans themselves and, and what that means. <clears throat> and then a little potpourri at the end and then time for Q&A. Okay, so applications. So most lenders are finally accepting applications from everyone. Um, there were a couple of lenders that were kind of late to the party, in my opinion, um, with their portals that maybe only opened up in the last three to four weeks, but I believe everyone is open and accepting applications. So that's a definite improvement over where we are a couple of months ago when some of the um, bigger lenders weren't even accepting applications yet. The SBA is processing and approving loan forgiveness applications. So as you recall, once you get through your lender's process, they send your application to the SBA and the SBA does their own process and then either approves or rejects your application. I'm not aware of anyone, and this is not to say it's not happening, but I haven't seen any large loans, meaning more than 2 million get approved yet. I know there are some in process and there are some that should be getting through the process this week. Um, but I know there are a lot of loans, less than 2 million that have been approved by the SBA. 
And I'm not aware of any, and none of our clients that we've been working with or um, other businesses that we're aware of, none of them have been rejected after they got through the SBA. So some may have had to provide some additional information to the SBA, but if they were approved by the lender, they're getting approved by the SBA. So that's good news that the lenders are, you know, providing the good filter for the SBA to make sure the applications are as they should be before they get to the SBA. And as far as the turnaround, um, you know, on the front end, it was so slow. A lot of people submitted their applications in August and they got sent into the SBA in August and then it took months for them to come out. Recently, I've seen the SBA turnaround as short as seven to 10 business days, um, but it's, it's completely unknown. Uh, you know, you might submit it and get it in seven days and another business submits and doesn't get here back for four weeks. So <clears throat> I can't say that there's any expected time frame, unfortunately. So um, I guess just be patient if you haven't heard, um, but the, the process is working um, as designed. It's just taking, it's just taking some time. Okay, so <clears throat> what have we learned over the past, let's say three months when people have been submitting loan forgiveness applications? In our conversations with our clients and with lenders that uh, we're friends with in the lending industry, you know, to make your application, <coughs> excuse me, really simple, it's allergy season here in Texas. And so I apologize for that. Um, you can make your application really simple if you just use gross wages. You know, on the application, you're allowed to use all different kinds of costs, right? You can use payroll, which includes gross wages, retirement costs, health insurance, SUDA. And then you can use non-payroll costs with the minimum requirement being at least you report at least 60% of your costs as wages. But once the Flexibility Act was passed that allowed you to report up to 24 weeks of costs, it kind of became clear to us that using gross wages only makes the application process more simple. Um, with the ability to report 24 weeks of gross wages, most companies are getting to 100% forgiveness mathematically by just using their gross wages. They're not having to dig in and, and get pick up any of those other costs. Another reason to just use gross wages is that the documentation requirements for it are pretty straightforward, right? And you've got to spend it on, pay, on certain 60% on payroll anyway. So you're already pulling together all your payroll reports. <clears throat> the documentation requirements for the other costs are more burdensome um, than using gross wages. So I'm gonna give you some examples of that. So let's say you wanna include rent on your application, which you absolutely are eligible to do. When you do that, you've got to provide to the lender as support a copy of the lease, as well as verification of payment. So depending on the formal structure or informal structure of your lease agreement with your, um, with your landlord, that might be a canceled check. Um, it might be, maybe you have it set up for direct or um, automatic transfer out of your account. Whatever that is, it's not just merely saying, look, I have this lease in place. They also want to see copies of the actual payments of rent that you are claiming. So if it's canceled checks that prove that you paid, they want to see the copies of the canceled checks or scanned copies, whatever, a scan on your bank statement, whatever that looks like these days for you. As far as utilities, um, there are the, the process to um, claim utilities is twofold. So first of all, you have to provide a copy of the invoice for the period that includes February 15th of 20 to prove that that service was in place at your location on that date. Then beyond that, you have to provide copies of all the invoices that you're including in your costs. So let's say it's the May, June, July, August, September electric bill. So you'll have to provide copies of all of those bills and then verification of payment. With an electric bill, maybe it's easy, right? Because on the next statement in the reconciliation, it shows here's your balance, here's your beginning balance, here's where we received your payment, here's your new charges. Um, with others, it may not be as simple and you might have to go back to pulling canceled checks or pulling um, bank statements that show the EFT where you pay your electric bill automatically, whatever it is. So the documentation requirements for these other types of costs, they just take more time 
and more effort on your part than let's say payroll. So probably for the last eight to 10 weeks, we've been recommending to our clients that we're working with, hey, just try to get there with payroll. Um, it makes the process easier. The lender you know, is comfortable with the payroll. It's less work for you. Um, so try to get there with payroll if you can. <clears throat> so there's an uptick in chatter. If you watch the news, um, I kind of had to take a break from the news after the election. It was just too overwhelming. But if you've gotten back into the news, there is an uptick, uptick in chatter about a new COVID relief package in Congress. Um, one of the things they're talking about is a possible modification of the loan forgiveness reporting requirements for loans up to 150,000. So back in, um, I forget, back in October, the SBA released Form 3508S, and it was a simplified form for loans less than 50,000. And for those size loans, it exempted those companies from the FTE and wage reduction requirements, which you know, was helpful in that those businesses, A, no longer had to calculate those, but if they did have a reduction, they were no longer, um, subject to the math that, that causes a reduction. Anyway, it simplified the process. So there is some talk about doing something similar, maybe not the exact same thing, they won't really say, of course, for loans up to 150,000. So if you do have an FTE reduction or you, you, know, you did cut wages because you had to, and, and if you go through the formulas and you're just not getting to 100% forgiveness and you're in this zone, you might wanna wait and see. Um, you have 10 months from the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. So there, there really is no rush other than, um, you know, the fatigue of having to deal with this. There's no literal rush for you to hurry up and file. Um, you have time. So if you wanted to wait and kind of see what the legislation shakes out, if it might benefit you, you should definitely do that um, because you have the time. The lender can't force you to apply. You know, they can send you emails a lot and they can call you and say, hey, you need to apply, but they really, excuse me, they really can't force you to apply because you have time um, under the regulations. So that's something to consider. Um, just some high level, you know, there's a budget bill that has to be passed sometime in the next four or five days or else there will be some sort of government shutdown. You know, we kind of reached this point almost every year, it seems like. So sometime in the next week or so, they, the Congress has to pass something in order to, you know, band-aid the funding in order to keep the government running. So the speculation is right now is that there will be a COVID relief package tacked on to that legislation. Um, the last, I forget, last I heard was 900 billion. You know, these are very large numbers being thrown around. Um, but in the current version, I believe there's uh, going to be an additional round of PPP funding. So, you know, I, I know probably everyone's tired of hearing about PPP, but it was a very beneficial program for a lot of businesses out there that helped them get through. And so there is another round of PPP funding being considered in this package. Now, the there will be some changes to the qualifying provisions for this next round of PPP funding. You know, this last time in the CARES Act, it was very vague, um, basically under 500 employees, or you had a certain NAICS code or your franchisee. Um, basically, that, that was it. You know, if you met those limited terms, you could get a PPP loan. And a lot of companies got PPP loans, millions of companies. In this next round, they're going to, they're saying they're going to reduce the amount of companies that are eligible and make, they're going to make it a requirement that you actually had a reduction in your revenues in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. There's no real specifics out there about what that means. Um, we've heard maybe a 25 to 35% reduction in revenues as a result of COVID. How that will be measured, what the time frame is that that's going to be measured by, what are you comparing to, what if you're a new business. Mm. I don't know the answers to any of those questions yet. Um, and they're also saying they will reduce the headcount to you have to have less than 300 employees. Will they still extend it to the franchises so that you know you you know, if you have a franchise with locations less than 300, I don't really know. 
um, how that's going to shake out. These are really the only two metrics that we were able to um, get our hands on that kind of mean anything. So if PPP was a great thing for you and you're still struggling, you know, I think that's some good news that there is going to be another P a round of PPP funding in that package. So, you know, if you can reach out to your congressman in your district or, you know, in your state and say, hey, you know, we really need this COVID relief, I think that would be beneficial. There are a lot of trade or organizations that are really pushing for um, additional COVID relief. And so, you know, if you want to contact your center or your congressman, I think that would be beneficial. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about taxes. I will say this is the only thing that's new. And, you know, I probably never used a coffin in any of my presentations before, but unfortunately it pretty well describes what the IRS did um, with their latest ruling. So if you've heard me talk in any of the previous sessions, there was always this wishy-washy, is it taxable, is it not taxable, are your expenses deductible, are they not deductible, where are we at, what should you do? Well, they finally answered the question. Um, and they said on November 18th, they said they issued a revenue ruling and it says the expenses are not deductible. So, <clears throat> and more specifically, it's revenue ruling 2020-27 if you, you know, need, some to, need something to put you to sleep tonight. It clarifies that expenses associated with the use of PPP loan funds are not deductible in the tax year they are paid or incurred if there is a reasonable expectation of forgiveness. Um, you know, what is a reasonable expectation of forgiveness? It goes on to kind of talk about if you follow the rules, if you spent the money the way you were supposed to spend, and if you were to file an application, you'd probably get forgiven. That's a reasonable expectation of forgiveness. There has been some question for, um, for businesses who receive loans greater than $2 million as to whether or not the loan necessity questionnaire, which we're not going to talk about today, but <clears throat> whether or not that puts any doubt as to this reasonable expectation of forgiveness. There's no answer about that. Of course, they didn't address that in this revenue ruling. So if that's a concern of yours, you want to talk to your tax advisor about that. But aside from that, they kind of pretty much made it clear that whether you filed for forgiveness or not, whether you've received forgiveness or not, doesn't matter. If you spent the money as prescribed in 2020, those expenses are not deductible. So let's kind of walk through an example and what that really means to you <clears throat> as a business owner. So let's say you received a $20,000 PPP loan and you spent all of it. What that means is on your 2020 tax return, $20,000 of your expenses are not deductible. And I've got some examples here. <clears throat> so you can see if this is a very simple income statement that I made up for a company. Um, and there's two columns here, forgiveness received in 2020 and forgiveness received in 2021. So this is the income statement for 2020 in those two scenarios. So you can see in our first column here, I've got forgiveness income of $20,000 that I received. So for book purposes, my net income on my books looks like 39,000. Now, if I have not received forgiveness, if I don't receive forgiveness to 2021, I'm not gonna record that income until 2021, okay? Um, that is gonna sit on my books, on my balance sheet as a loan up until the time that I'm forgiven. Now, those of you who do high level gap basis financial statements, you have other options that we're not gonna talk about, but. Um, just for, <laughs> excuse me, a small business who's probably not dealing with that. Um, this is how your income statement would look in these two scenarios. So let's say you don't have any other book tax differences. You don't have depreciation, you don't have meals and entertainment, nothing like that. What does that look like? So in our first scenario where you receive forgiveness in 2020, you take your book net income, you're going to subtract out your forgiveness income that you've recorded, but then you have to add back $20,000 because the money that you spent with that, the expenses you incurred with the 20,000 are not deductible. So this is the math of how it works, which gets you back to 39,000, which is where you started. Now for those, let's say you did not receive forgiveness in 2021, 
you'll see that you end up in the same position, okay, with taxable income of $39,000 in this example. So that's kind of what the revenue ruling is saying. It, they don't care whether you got forgiveness or not. The expenses are still not deductible if you incurred them in 2020. Okay. <clears throat> so a couple caveats here. There's no guidance, and some of you may not care about this unless you actually prepare your own tax return. There's no guidance on how to actually report this on your tax return. Um, so they haven't really said, you know, how do you delineate what expenses are not deductible? How do you present that on your actual tax return? There's no guidance on that yet. There's also no guidance on how this concept applies to a business that files a Schedule C, um, which may be a lot of you. You're not, you're not incorporated. You're not an S Corp. You're not a partnership. You're a sole proprietor um, and you file a Schedule C. So Let's talk about the Schedule C for a second and what that really means, because um, I think that's going to be important when those of you who are Schedule C filers get to the process of filing your tax return. And, and, and if you do your own, you, you'll need to think this through. Um, so let's say you're a Schedule C filer. You choose the 24 week period. When you go through the math, the formula for your forgiveness is very simple, actually. Um, you take your 2019 Form 1040 Schedule C, line 31, you divide it by 12, you multiply it by two and a half, and you get forgiveness up to a maximum of 20,833. So how is that math, which as you can see, has nothing to do with wages, payroll, rent, nothing. It's just a formula. How does that then translate onto your tax return? Um, Nobody knows the answer to that that hasn't been addressed. So if you're familiar with your Schedule C, you know, the line we're talking about here, this line 31, that's your net profit or loss. So that's kind of the number it's focused on. So how do you take that concept and then on your 2020 Schedule C, what up here in this section becomes non-deductible? Or is there just this, you know, line item add back. We've got 27B here, reserved for future use. Maybe they'll put it there. I don't know. So that hasn't been worked out, which makes it really challenging if you're a Schedule C business owner to try to do your tax planning for the end of the year, right? If you don't know conceptually how this works on your Schedule C. <clears throat> so there's some frustrating things about this process. Um, but there is a ray of hope out there. Congress is insisting, and they've been insisting, to be honest with you, for like three or four months that they're gonna legislate a change. So we're hopeful that this COVID legislation that I talked about earlier, that is hopefully gonna you know, catch a ride on the, on the government funding bill later this week, we're hopeful that that will include a provision that makes the expenses deductible. Um, just makes it much more simple for everyone the loan forgiveness income would remain non-taxable, um, but the issue we're concerned with here is making sure those expenses are deductible. So, you know, if there was ever another reason to contact your legislators and say, hey, we need COVID relief, and oh, by the way, can you please make the expenses deductible when you do so, um, now's the time, because it is really challenging to do your tax planning for the end of the year when you don't know if this is going to happen, you know, it's like, it's like they're promising it's going to happen, but until then, that's not what the law is. That just makes it really hard. <clears throat> so what does that mean? So I got another graphic here and it's basically the same table as before, but with two new columns added that says if the law changes, meaning Congress comes through and says, yeah, those expenses are deductible you know, what does that do to each one of our columns here? And you can see your taxable income is now $20,000 less in both scenarios for 2020. Um, so it is a significant impact um, on a business for this to be changed. And so we're really hoping that Congress will come through with that, hopefully this week, bring us all an early holiday present, right? Okay, so what are, what, what are we doing? how are we advising our clients? So how we're advising our clients is we're computing their fourth quarter estimates and their extension payments both ways, right? The current law where they're not deductible, our fingers crossed law where hopefully they will be a deductible eventually. 
Um, and then we're presenting it to our clients and saying, you know, this is kind of a business owner decision as to what you're going to pay in. Um, you know, if you if you don't pay in the excess tax and, and they don't change the law, you know, you could be subject to some estimated tax penalties um, in the spring of 2021 when you file your tax return. So there are some risks depending on which method you choose. If you're a 1040 filer, meaning you either file a Schedule C or you have a pass-through entity like an S-Corp or a partnership, you may have some options to make yourself what we in the business call penalty proof. Um, so you should talk to your tax advisor about that um, in this scenario where we really don't know how it's gonna shake out, right? So in general, to make yourself penalty proof, you have a tax liability of less than a thousand or during 2020, you made estimated tax payments and withholding equal to the lesser of 90% of the current year tax or 100% of the prior year tax. Now, if you're AGI, your adjusted gross income for 2019, and that's a number on your tax return um, on one of those first couple pages. <clears throat> if those over 150,000, then you have to pay in 110% of the prior year tax. So if you're not really sure what to do, you should reach out to your tax advisor and kind of go, go through the scenarios and see what the options are, see if you have the ability to get to a, a place where you're penalty proof, so that at least if you do have to pay the tax eventually, um, you know, you're not going to have to pay any estimated tax penalties on that. Okay, any questions on the, um, on the taxes? I'm going to pull this out here. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, let me see if there's any tax specific questions here. The revenue ruling is simply IRS confirmation of current tax law. What are the changes Congress what are the chances Congress will change the tax law? Uh, they keep saying everyone is convinced that Congress is going to eventually change the law. Nobody knows when they're going to get around to it and get it tacked onto a bill. It's not something significant enough that they've said they could draft a separate bill for. It has to catch a ride, so they say, on another bill. So we're hoping the COVID relief package is that avenue. Um, so everyone is really hopeful. I don't want to put it I don't want to put a percentage out there because I just I just don't like to bet on the government because I just don't know. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to go through some of these other questions before we jump into the third party payroll reports because it is kind of a, a technical topic. Um, we received our PPP loan in April. I thought I was only able to use eight weeks, not 24. Um, no, when the Flexibility Act came out, it extended the covered period to 24. So you have a choice between eight and 24. Anyone who got a loan after the Flexibility Act has to use the 24. Um, so that's definitely beneficial for you. Let's see, utilities. I'm not really sure what these questions are, but utilities includes electric, gas, water, trash, phone, and internet. Um, so all of those things are included. Let's see, you wrote that we have 10 months from the end of the covered period to apply for forgiveness. That is correct. Yes, you have until September of 2021 if your covered period ends in December. So, um, and the loan, the loan repayment does not begin until you get your forgiveness decision. So I know you, a lot of you have loan documents, and we'll talk about this a little more at the end, that say you might have we're supposed to start making payments in November. The Flexibility Act that came out in June said, no, we're gonna extend that and you don't have to actually make payments on your PPP loan until you receive a forgiveness decision. Um, so that's not something you have to worry about. You don't have to make payments until they make a decision. Um, for loan is 154,000, do you recommend waiting? That's kind of up to you. I mean, like I said, you've got plenty of time um, I haven't heard anything beyond 150,000, um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. There's been a lot of surprises along the way, no doubt. Okay, so let's talk about third-party payroll reports. And when I talk, when I'm talking about this, what I'm referring to, um, without being, well, I kind of have to be specific about the different vendors, so you know what I'm talking about. But if you use, let's say, an ADP, Paychex, Paycom, Greenlink, whatever it is, to do your payroll, a lot of them are offering um, the ability to generate PPP reports for you. 
And if you look at those reports, they look like they generate a lot of the data points that you need in order to, to fill out your forgiveness application. And, the, and they, they do, they do provide um, the data points that need. Some things that I've noticed, however, is that, um, you know, when I first got into public accounting, things were a lot more manual. And as things became motivated, my boss always said, you know, when you're thinking about things that are automated, you always have to remember the concept of garbage in, garbage out, right? The computer will only do its assigned function on the data it's provided. So if the data is not good, the result is not going to be good. And so no one would intentionally ever give bad data on payroll, right, in, to these payroll providers. And your, your employees are getting paid, right? So obviously the information you've given them is sufficient for your employees to get paid correctly. So there's good data in there, but there are some, a lot of situations where incorrect data, which is not affecting paychecks that your employees are receiving, will affect these PPP calculations. And if you imagine, you know, you're one of those big payroll providers, you're having to design a report <clears throat> for thousands and thousands of companies, right? So they're designing um, formulas and calculations and algorithms that pull data on high level assumptions about data. So, but you know, small businesses especially, you don't necessarily pay everyone quote normal. Um, and I, I use air quotes to say, you know, I have a client that um, they have, their employees can get paid all kinds of different ways. Depending on the task they do, they might get paid hourly. Um, some of the tasks they perform, they get paid piece rate, you know? So if they accomplish, <coughs> excuse me, if they accomplish X many tasks, they get paid X dollars. And then maybe if they're doing a sales function, they're gonna get paid commissions. So you could have one employee who in their one paycheck got paid hourly, commissionly, and commissions and piece rate. And so that person's data points don't really line up well with the requirements of the PPP group program, which are heavily favored towards FTEs, right? Because this person who got paid three different ways, maybe they didn't have any hours input into the payroll system for the time that they were working on the piece rate task or the time that they were in the sales department and working on commission. So they received a nice fat paycheck for this pay period but if you look at their hours, it only shows 8.6 hours, <coughs> excuse me. And that was the time that they were actually doing the functions for which they get paid hourly. So as you can imagine, this person is probably full-time and their FTE should be a 1.0, but based on the data that's entered, they're coming out as a 0.2. So you really have to look at your data points and how you pay your employees to see if your FTE calculations are coming out correctly. Um, the same with the 25% calculation where you figure out whether or not someone had a more than 25% reduction in, in wages. Um, if they get paid all kinds of different ways, that computation is not simple. And the formulas that are input are based on simplicity. You know, they're based on on the simplicity of hourly people get paid hourly, salaried people get paid salary, commission people get paid commission, and we're entering hours for everybody. Um, and that may not be the case. You may not enter hours for your commissioned employees, right? Because you don't care what hours they work. They make their sales, their pay is based on their commission, so their hours are irrelevant. Well, if you don't have hours input into the payroll system, then it's not going to compute an FTE for that person. So these are all things to think about as you're looking at the data that's coming out of these third party reports as to whether or not the data is reliable. Now, for a lot of you, it's going to be reliable because you probably do pay your employees very simply um, and that that will work out. Um, the things that I would say is just a caution used to go through the reports and just give it the reasonableness test. Does this make sense to me? Does my FTE count make sense to me based on what I know about my business? You know, it's calculating a wage reduction for this person. Does that make sense to me based on what I know about what I pay him or her? Um, so as you're going through those reports, just give them the smell test and make sure that the 
the results make sense based on what you know. And that may, some, they bet, that may not be something that the payroll clerk could do. It may have to be something that the owner has to do, has to go through those reports and see if the results make sense. Um, also errors in dates or missing dates, rehires, you know, some of the formulas I've noticed are based on hire dates. <clears throat> so if you're not absolutely perfect about getting all those hire dates incorrectly or term dates or rehire dates, you know, your employees can still get paid correctly with those dates missing. But when this PPP report is running its formulas to give you results, those dates might cause an, an error in the output. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of a system where it's pointing out a lot of the, the problems in your data set for payroll that don't affect how people get paid. It just affects the data set that's in there. Um, so it's just something to kind of be cautioned. I'm going to skip through the slides, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit, because um, I've kind of talked about all this. Um, and I'm going to go to an example here. You'll have all these slides. Um, Lisa will send these out later, but um, I just want to kind of go through one thing here at the end. So here's an example of a PPP report that came out of one of the large providers. And when I looked at this for this client, the, the two things that I looked at and I saw to my, I said to myself, well, I know there's some errors in the data set because these things don't make sense to me. And that was this salary hourly wage reduction on line three. And then line nine, the amount paid to owner employees. So first of all, I know that they have owner employees that receive paychecks and those their gross wages should be on line nine. And that amount was zero. So I knew that the owners were not categorized correctly as owners in the system, which meant it was pulling the owners into the other calculations for employees. And that's critical because the, the limitations on owners are much more significant than they are on employees. So that was the first thing. I knew we had to get the owners categorized correctly. The second thing is this client swore to me up and down that they did not cut anyone's wages. They knew that was a requirement and if anything, they were more generous with their employees during the covered period because they wanted to make sure they met the requirements. So when we dug into the detail for that item on line three, you know, here's what we found. <clears throat> and this is a sample, you know, um, we've got the Brady Bunch and their cast from Friends here. And you can see that their cash compensation for all of these people during the covered period only two people actually received a paycheck, Mike and Carol. No one else in this, in this list that the payroll provider is saying have a salary hourly wage reduction even got a paycheck during the covered period. So I shouldn't even be doing a calculation for these employees because they didn't get paid during the covered period. So that's kind of the first indication. So I went, the client and I went through and said, okay, well, if they didn't get a paycheck, you know, we're going to contest that because that it doesn't apply. We didn't, you didn't work for me during the covered period. This formula doesn't apply to you. Um, you know, the first person, Mike, we kind of conceded, okay, that's probably right. So <clears throat> once we looked at the details, it kind of became obvious that there were some sort of errors in the data set that was causing a, a significant calculation error for this particular client. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of some things to look at when you're looking at the third party um, reports is just to make sure you're considering whether or not the results make sense. And when they don't dig into the details and try to figure it out. So I know if you figure out that, oh, we're missing pay dates for these people or we're missing blah, blah, blah for these people, you can go back in and input all that, those uh, metrics into your data set and rerun those PPP reports. So there are ways to work with those third-party reports if you figure out that you're correcting your data set. Um, so anyway, okay, I'm gonna hop to the questions right quick and answer a couple if I can. Um, let's see, we use a third-party payroll company, but I'm struggling with what documentation we need to show to prove FTE for the EZ form. If your third-party payroll company can give you an FTE report, that's the item that's most likely to be correct, um, especially if you kind of have a plain vanilla employee group where you have salary and hourly and inner hours for everyone, every pay period. So if you can really work through the data set to get your FTEs to come out correctly, that's really the best thing, especially if you have 
a lot of employees, calculating FTEs can get really time intensive. Um, so if at a minimum you can work with their reports to get your FTEs, I think that's beneficial. Let's see, <clears throat> is there any, okay. Okay, none of these are specifically related to third party reports. So I'm gonna hop back to the presentation, talk about loans briefly. Um, and then we'll go back to the q and A. I I think we're going to skip the potpourri. Those, are, those slides are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but let's just get through this loans and loan covenants real quick. So just remember in the end, this is really a loan. Just the same kind of loan as if you had gone to your lender and said, hey, I need a line of credit. Or, hey, I'd like to build a building. I need a building loan. It's the same kind of loan. It's, you know, fully full set of documents, legally binding, just like all that other stuff. So make sure you're aware of those documents, get a copy of those documents for your file, make sure you understand what you signed. Um, like I said before, the Flexibility Act extended the payment deferral period so that you don't have to make any payments until the SBA remits your forgiveness decision and remits your forgiveness to the lender. That's the point when payments are gonna start if you have any remaining loan balance. Okay, so you've got plenty of time. You don't need to make payments, even though your loan documents that you have say you're supposed to start making payments in November um, and we've passed November. So don't worry about that. Um, the SBA is gonna remit, <clears throat> remit accrued interest on the forgiven portion of the loan. So if you see an SBA notice and it has a forgiven amount that's larger than your PPP loan, the difference is the interest. Um, and so technically you should record that interest as an expense and then record the corresponding income on your books. Um, but there is interest on that. So if you do have any remaining balance on your loan, you're going to have to pay that back interest. Um, but it's probably not going to be a lot, right? Because it's a 1% loan. You've probably only been accruing since April or May. So it won't be significant, but any unpaid portion by the SBA will have interest attached. Um, those of you who mo are most likely to end up with some sort of PPP loan balance at the end is those of you who receive the EIDL grant. This was um, $1,000 per employee. It was put out there in early April. You could receive up to $10,000 and your EIDL grant reduces the amount of your PPP loan forgiveness. So if you got both of these programs that you're not prohibited from doing so, but it, the EIDL grant is going to affect the PPP loan forgiveness. Now, I'm not talking about EIDL loans. Let's make that clear. The EIDL loan is completely separate. Um, it doesn't apply to this. It doesn't have any interaction with the PPP. <clears throat> so when you're going through those loans, just as you prepare for year end, if you have not received forgiveness and you have more than one loan, um, you know, see if your PPP loan might have um, caused a covenant violation. I know there were a lot of you that you had an existing um, lender relationship, but when it came to the PPP application process, either your lender wasn't participating or your lender got maxed out really quickly. And a lot of you had to go elsewhere in order to get a PPP loan. So if you had existing debt with that lender, the fact that you got a PPP loan from another lender might in and of itself be a covenant violation. And so you just wanna make sure you talk to your, your previous lender about that. Hey, is there a cure? Let's make sure I'm not in default. You're not gonna call my loan. You know, I'm working on getting forgiveness. Just make sure you have those conversations with your lender so you don't have an inadvertent default um, or a default that isn't cured with a covenant waiver with that existing lender. Okay, like I said, we're going to skip the potpourri and I'm going to go back to the questions because I think you'll get more out of me answering questions than out of the, um, the potpourri. Okay, let's see. Um, let me go back to. Um, if you received a PPP loan in April, but if you elect to use the 24 weeks, would it be true that your staff could not change during 24 weeks? We had two people quit after eight weeks and we only replaced one of them. Will this show up not in compliance of keeping the staff? No, you do not get penalized for people quitting. You also don't get penalized if you had to fire someone for cause. Um, and that's two great things about the program. It didn't require you to just hang on to all your employees with a death grip, hoping that you make it through in order to comply with the program. So in this scenario where you had two people quit and you only replaced one, 
you need to look at the description of the FTE exceptions, <clears throat> the FTE reduction exceptions, and read that paragraph in the instructions for the form 3508. And if you have, if you do have an FTE problem where you had a reduction that you're not able to overcome mathematically, then you can use that FTE reduction exception for one of these people. Um, and that should probably help you get to you to where you need to be. Um, is there any talk of the EIDL advances not being used towards forgiveness? No, everything I've seen, and I've actually seen some SBA um, notifications and it'll say, here's your PPP loan, here's your EIDL advance, here's the amount you're forgiven. Um, so they're, they're not changing that at this point. We've been very fortunate not to have had to use our loan. It's been sitting in our account since April. Should we use it to improve our chances of forgiveness? Okay, so on the very front end, we were all concerned about the tracing of funds, right? So if you heard me talk on the front end, I probably said things like, you need to have a separate bank account. And as you spend it, you need to show that you're spending it and have this detailed tracing of funds. Um, based on what we've seen with the application process, that's not really necessary. And so all you have to do is show that you incurred payroll and you incurred rent and you incurred whatever cost you incurred during that covered period. The fact that you didn't quote use your PPP money is not relevant. You used money that you had in your business and you incurred those costs. So the tracing of funds is not relevant. You can just use the costs that were incurred and report those on your application for forgiveness. Um, so I think that that's a really good question. How do we document or handle the EIDL portion of the PPP loan withheld related to tax? Um, well, the portion that's not um, forgiven, you're going to have to repay. So that's going to be debt. So you would just show the amount that was forgiven is the amount of expenses that are not deductible. And you'll see that when you get your SBA notification. Now, the question is, you, if you haven't gotten your forgiveness yet, you don't know for sure, I think you should just assume that you're going to get full forgiveness and that they're going to reduce it by the amount of your EIDL grant when you're looking at your tax planning for the end of the year. Okay, the bank is asking for a 941, but when you lease employees from a third-party payroll company, they supply only a 940. Okay, so have that conversation with your, with your lender and explain that to them. Um, and just provide them with whatever you have. Um, they probably just don't understand the concept of leased employees. Um, so you'll just, you'll just have to have your conversation with them. Uh, we're an LLC and officers of the company were included in payroll. We're assuming that officer's compensation was still covered, qualified and the PPP program. It is qualified. It's just limited to um, either 15,385 or 20,833, depending on whether you use eight or 24 weeks. So owner compensation is still eligible. Um, if, if you're talking about an LLC that files as either an S corp or as an, uh, C, a Schedule C, um, then yes, that officer wages is still considered a covered cost. Now, if this is an LLC that files as a partnership, that's a different answer and you need to look at the rules on the partners um, and what you get to include on a partner that receives a guaranteed payment. Um, okay, back to the application section, what supporting documentation is required to prove mortgage interest payments? So that would just be copies <clears throat> of your monthly statement that hopefully you get. If you don't get a monthly statement on your loan, then you would go back to an amortization schedule, hopefully that your lender provided, and you could show each payment that you made and the component that was interest of each payment. Um, okay. Um, I have paid employees to stay at home and quarantine the ADR is required. Is there any tax reductions for those funds? Um, no, I mean, this is all kind of about the PPP program, which was intended to keep paying people, even if literally they weren't working for you. Um, so whether or not someone actually performed services for the payroll they received is not relevant. So hopefully that answers that question. Let's see, we've used all the payroll portion of the PPP loan plus some, but not all the utilities. Is there a chance they'll change the rules so that some of our utility portion can be used for payroll? Okay, so there's no rules. Um, Michael, I can't say your last name, I apologize. So there's no rules on what you have to use it for. You can use it all for payroll. Um, and that's kind of what I talked about at the beginning is if you can get to forgiveness just by using payroll, use payroll. 
Um, there was no requirement to use any portion for utilities or rent or any of those things. There was only a requirement that you use at least 60% for payroll, but you can use 100% for payroll. Um, so make sure that's clear. You might want to go back through and read and through the instructions of the Form 3508. Um, I think that will help you. And if you go through the actual math, you'll see, uh, you'll see how that works. Okay, a couple more questions. I know, oh, are we done, Robert? Do you want me to stop talking? No, we, we, we got about a minute or two left that we can, we can use. Uh, okay, let me see what I haven't, uh, what I haven't touched on here. Okay, we got a loan in April, it's for eight and a half weeks. Our loan was 284, we use it most of the funds in eight weeks, blah, 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 blah. If we switch to 24 weeks, we then use 24 weeks of payroll. Yes, I know it seems crazy, right? So in the beginning, we're worried about the tracing of funds. Once we went to 24 weeks, the tracing of funds became irrelevant. And the idea was, let's just stick with payroll. It's easy to document, it ties right to your payroll reports. You know, it's an easy number to show to your lender. Um, but, and so your question is, we will use much more than the amount received. That's correct. So in your example, you're probably going to show, I'm guessing 600,000 or more of payroll in about 24 weeks. And you can report all 600,000 of payroll on your loan forgiveness application. Um, ultimately, there's, there's three lines where it calculates what your forgiveness is. So in your case, if you got an EIDL grant of 10,000, you're eligible for a maximum forgiveness of 274,000. Okay, so you got a loan of 284, you got an EIDL grant of 10, your maximum forgiveness is gonna be 274,000. Um, but go ahead and report all those expenses on your application up to 600, whatever it is, um, just to prove that yes, I, my business kept going and I spent all this money on payroll. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Okay, Robert, I'll wrap it up with that. All right. Thank you, Carrie Ann. We appreciate that expertise. Uh, a lot of great information. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat. Uh, you may need to go back and, and revisit the uh, webinar. It is being recorded. It will be posted later today on our website, so you can go back and review some of that information. Um, but again, Carrie Ann, we appreciate you sharing this, this information with us. Um, as updates come about, we will get with Carrie Ann and schedule another time for some, some more updates as we see those. But uh, we want to thank, thank you for uh, being on with us today. Just a reminder, we have our restaurant uh, special session tomorrow, and we have our, our alternative funding options on Thursday. Uh, please join us for those sessions. And until then, uh, thanks for being with us, and have a great day. Thanks, Robert.